we are working through chapter three in thermodynamics, and uh, I'm going to answer questions uh, from the class about different aspects of the problem solving and concepts of chapter three. So uh, this will be on our Moodle page, and we can start answering questions. Where should I begin? And we don't have to go in order, just 327. 327 it is. All right. So problem 327 asks us to complete this table for R134A. All right, now there's a couple of things you need to do just to orient yourself before you start working with the table. The first thing is take a look at the substance. We have tables for both water and R134A. Now, if you are, 134A is a refrigerant. It replaced R12 as the major, ma the, the most commonly used refrigerant, thank you, in, uh, in the United States back in 1993. Uh, it was R12, R134A is a, chloro or is a fluorocarbon. R1, R12 is a chlorofluorocarbon. Um, in general, refrigerants tend to be odd. They have to flare, they have to change state at very certain conditions in order to pull heat. And so they tend to not be real common substances. Uh, a good, there are some good refrigerants that were very common, that are very common in daily usage. Liquid ammonia makes a really good refrigerant, uh, but it's also quite toxic. So it's not a good, um, it's, it's not a good public use. R12 had an effect of potentially destroying ozone. And uh, so R134A was uh, implemented in order to sort of overcome that challenge. R134A is somewhat flammable. So back in the old days, they thought R134A was a bad deal, but um, now it's, it's sort of like people know how to handle it. And so it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's been the most accepted refrigerant for uh, consumer use in the last almost 30 years. Yes? Why don't they just give it a real name? What? Like coolant. Like coolant. That's what it usually, they, so that's a great question. They call it, whatever is the most, whatever you're using, they tend to just call Freon. So Freon, but Freon to, yes. Exactly, that's exactly right. Yes. Well, Freon is, the, the, this is the way it's used. There may be something fancier than this, but generally speaking, whatever refrigerant you're using, people refer to as Freon. So like right now, it's common to refer to R134A as Freon. But back in the old days, R12 was referred to as Freon. So uh, I, I don't know if there's a more scientific answer, but that's a really good question. But so if you say Freon, and you're referring to 134A, you're, you're probably pretty, pretty good, okay? So anyway, so the first two things before we use the table, we wanna know what substance we're using. The next is we wanna know what set of units. And if you look at uh, table 327, we have temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and pressure in PSIA. That means that we are in US customary units. So after we identify those two things, we need to start looking at the table that's going to present us with the best data. Now, before we do that, here's sort of the theory. Um, if you take temperature or pressure and you plot it against a thermodynamic property such as specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, or entropy, which we don't know all of these yet, but they can look like that. You're generally going to get an envelope. On one side of the envelope, on the downside of the envelope uh, will be a compressed liquid. On the high side of the envelope will be a superheated vapor. And in the envelope, I often refer to this as the two-phase envelope, but it's also referred to as the saturated liquid vapor region. There's a bunch of different names for this, but this is, your authors generally refer to it as this, 
and this is something that I commonly say, those two things mean essentially the same thing. On the boundary of conditions between the compressed liquid line and the two-phase region is the saturated liquid line and between superheated and two-phase is the saturated vapor line, okay? So is this saying, like, if you had a pot of water, yes. you're starting at the very bottom of our chart, and it's going to heat up, and once it hits the top point, oh, no. from there it's going to start turning into the vapor? You've the got a really good idea, but basically it would be talking about this line. That yes, that so, like, this would be the pan of cold water over here, right? Uh -huh. The temperature increases, but it's still all liquid until you get to this point, and then that first bubble of gas evolves, okay? Then what happens is the temperature is going to remain the same as you evolve gas, right? Because that's when we say, like, the boiling point, the boiling temperature of water at one atmosphere of pressure is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So temperature and pressure as the boiling occurs uh, are not independent. You have the same temperature and pressure. At, as you increase, but what you do is you increase the specific volume and you increase the internal heat, the internal energy, okay? So here's where you get the first bubble of gas, here's where you get the last bubble of gas. And everywhere in here, you have a mixture, so maybe it's 10% liquid, 90 per, or t excuse me, 10% vapor, 90% liquid over to the opposite as you go across. And we assume that to be a linear relationship across that two-phase envelope. It's pretty close for most of our substances. It's a safe assumption, okay? So when you get here, this is, you've boiled off all the water, and if you keep adding heat to it, the temperature will then go up, and the steam will become superheated. And there's a lot more energy associated with superheated steam than there is with um, two-phase liquid or with hot water. All right. And it gets bigger and bigger. That's what the specific volume tells us as well. Now, the saturated liquid line, so there's all kinds of different pressure temperature combinations where the substance will be in the two-phase envelope. So maybe here it's, I don't know, 40 degrees and 40 PSI. Maybe here it's 60 degrees and 50 PSI or something like that. But in the two-phase envelope, those two are not independent. The saturated liquid line and the saturated vapor line meet not always necessarily at the top of the curve, but they meet at some point, which is called the critical point. And above the critical point, the fluid is just a supercritical fluid. We don't see a lot of supercritical fluids, but they play a really important piece in chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, and there's some really weird behaviors that start occurring around the critical point as well, which are really interesting. So those are either going into mechanical or chemical engineering. You'll get to spend some time, uh, petroleum engineering, if we have any of those, you'll, you'll get to see some really interesting uh, near super near critical and supercritical behaviors, but for now, most of our envelopes look like this. So the first thing that we want to do now that we've decided we see that we're working with refrigerant or with freon, and that we're in U.S. customary units, is to find the correct tables. So I'm going to come back over here to the podium PC. Now you may have these printed off, or you may have them in your ebook or in your in your sit on the textbook, sit on the table, right? But I have them here. This is, these are actually the thermodynamic property tables taken from um, an older edition of the textbook. Appendix 1 is in SI units, and there's a bunch of different tables, but uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. Appendix 2 are the same tables, nearly identical tables, reproduced in English or U.S. customary units. Okay, so the first thing is we're in English units, so we're going to go to Appendix 2. Next thing is we need to find some tables. I want to look for the two-phase or the saturated behavior for not water. See, like if I look here, saturated water, temperature table. Yeah, there we go. So we want to come down here to the saturated curves, saturated data for... Freon or R134A. Okay, so here we are. Now, the other thing is table A11E is the data in the two-phase region organized by temperature. Right after this chart, after we get through the superheated, oh, I think I might have passed it up. Let's see. Okay, after we go through the data organized by temperature, 
you'll see that the next table is organized by pressure. So if you're given pressure, you can use one. If you're given temperature, you can use the other. But it's really the same data. It's just at slightly different points. But the data is the same, describing the same thing. All right, so let's take a look at uh, a 327E. It tells us that we have, uh, this is A, we have a pressure of 80 PSIA. We don't know what the temperature is, but we know that the enthalpy H which is um, sort of a, it's a property of heat, it's a property of energy of the system. Let me come over here to the document cam. Our value of H is 78 BTUs per pound of mass. All right, so the first thing we want to do is to think about this, this chart in conjunction with the property tables to decide are we in the two phase envelope, are we compressed liquid, or are we superheated? So going back over to our table, we know that we are at 80 PSI, so we're going to check this out, 80 PSI, and if we come over here to H, we see that H sub F is 33 point something, H sub G is 112 point something. Our H sub G is 78, right? So we know that H sub F, which would be the H right here, that just stands for the H of the fluid, is, and I'm going to use whole numbers, I'm not going to carry out the decimal points. This is 33, same units. H sub G, which would be right here, is 112, thank you, 112. All right, so since our value of H is between these two, it means that it's in the two-phase envelope. Okay. Now, if it was lower, it would make a compressed liquid. If it was higher, it would be superheated steam. So, we know it's in the middle. So, so our 33 goes to our first dot. Yes. And goes to our dot on the other side. That's so correct. Our, that is correct. Our, we take our H that we have and since it's in between. Mm -hmm. That's how we do that? Yes. Okay. That means that our phase description, which is one of the things they ask for, is two phase or we could say saturated liquid vapor. The next thing that they want is X. X is steam quality. I always crack a really lame joke at this point and say all these years in algebra you've been wondering what X was. X is steam quality. So ta-da, there you go. So what that means is we're somewhere in between here and here. If it were halfway in between here and here, if 78 was halfway between these two numbers, steam quality would be 50%. That would mean that 50% of the mass of our, of our mixture was in the liquid phase and 50% is in the vapor phase. But it's not dead in the middle. So how do we find out what X is? Yes. Right, and this, the way that that form, you're exactly right, Isaac, and the way that that formula comes about is we can say that any property, which we call Y, so now we know what Y is as well, any property is equal to X, which is the mass fraction in the steam, in the steam phase or in the vapor phase, times Y of G plus the mass fraction in the, in the liquid phase, which is going to be 1 minus X times Y sub F. All right, or specifically in our case, H is equal to X times H sub G plus 1 minus X times H sub F. All right, and I put up this equation because this is the, sort of the basis for finding X or finding a property based on X, but this is the root equation. All right, well here, we have this and this and this, and we want to solve for x, right? So if we solve for x, we could say h is equal to h times x sub g plus, I'm distributing h sub f minus x times h sub f. And if I keep my terms, I'm pulling this over to the other side of the equation to keep my x's together. like that. And finally, H minus H sub F over H sub G minus H sub F 
is equal to x. All right, now I'm going to come back to the document camera. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to the podium PC to show you something else. The denominator of that, which is h sub g minus h sub f, is actually this value in the middle of the table. h sub f g, if you look at it, is numerically this minus this on every line. So this is h sub f g is the same as h sub g minus h sub f, okay? You can subtract that yourself. You don't really need that column. But what it's saying is this is how much enthalpy it takes to cross the envelope from 0% steam quality to 100% steam quality. So it has a physical meaning, but it's mathematically quite easy to, um, to develop. So I'm going to pull up that, that value at 80 PSI. H sub FG is 78.8, so I'm going to call it 79, okay? So I'm going to say H sub FG. At 80 PSI, it's 78.8. Here's 80 PSI. There's 78.8. Okay. All right. Yeah. Like in the actual question. Yeah. Oh, I uh, gotcha. Okay. All right. So I'm just pulling it off the table, right? And you may have some little differences like that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that means I know that this is actually H sub FG. So I can say H minus H sub F over H sub FG. The H value I have is 78. H sub F is 33 over h sub fg, which is 79. So you can also see is this is the fraction of my h, the h of our mixture, minus the lower end over the total distance between the lower end and the upper end. So that's really just, that's just the fraction, isn't it? The fraction you are into the curve, or from the bottom, from the bottom of the curve. So here, 78 minus 33 is 45. Divide that by 79, and what is that value? 57, or 0 0.57. 0 0.57. So that means that X for this problem, or steam quality, is 0.57 or 57%. 57% of the mass is in the steam phase. So the, we write the it, you'll, I, I prefer to write it as a decimal, but you will see it as a percent. So I don't want it to, I want you to be aware that it could be both. And if you write it as a percent, it will be fine. So could we just use the H minus H of F over the H of, um, H of G minus H of F? Yeah, can we just yes. use it as a standard thing, or do you have to go through the... No, nope, you can use it as a standard thing. I wanted you to have the background, to it. The background on that equation. But yeah, you can jump in at any point as long as you're right. Absolutely. And that works with any property. It will work with U, it will work with V, it will work with S. Uh, All right. For a different pressure, would our little graph change? Yes. So does it go up? Like with a lower pressure, it goes up? Let me so come back over here. The critical point or whatever? Yes, the critical point is at a high pressure and temperature. So each one of these lines is called an isobar. In other words, the pressure from here to here is the same, right? But this pressure is greater than this pressure. So this graph isn't always a set deal. It's right. based upon what it would get a value. That is correct. Okay. This, this envelope for most substances looks a lot the same. For the two substances that we work with the most, R134A and water, they're very similar to this. You know, you'll be up or down in the two-phase envelope. Some of them like certain hydrocarbons. You know how you talk about, like, they talk about octane ratings? Um, petroleum fluids that are near H8, which is sort of what the octane readings are based on, sort of look like this. And the critical point is sort of off to the side. So there's an area under the, the critical point that's called retrograde condensation, which means, generally speaking, 
if you uh, lower the temperature, you lower the pressure, you would vaporize, right? There's an area of certain petroleum fluids where if you lower the pressure, you actually condense a two-phase liquid into a liquid. A two-phase fluid into a liquid. And that's referred to the area of retrograde condensation. And it's just odd, you know, but fluids, fluids can behave in odd ways. Water, for example, has an odd behavior, which you probably are aware of, that when it freezes, it gets less dense. Right, that's why ice floats. Most substances, when they solidify, they become more dense. So water has a certain retrograde behavior as well when it comes. So not all fluids are exactly the same, uh, and there's a lot of very strange behaving fluids, and even normal fluids have certain quirky behaviors. Uh, but for us, as we're starting to talk about phase behavior, this works very, very well. But like if you look at water, when you start looking at the three phases of water, um, you know, it sort of goes like this, where we have uh, lines between um, liquid, solid, and vapor. Uh, there's actually a triple point where all three exist. They coincide with each other. And then if you look at density right around the triple point, you have that strange little expanding behavior um, when it freezes. Now it doesn't continue, when it gets colder and freezes, it starts to contract again. But that's, that's wh why water freezes on top, which of course is pretty cool because otherwise I don't know what, I don't know what like lake or river life would look like in the wintertime if it was different. <laughs> You know, so it'd be a little odd. It would be different. So, yeah. But anyway. All the fish would come to the top and it'd be exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Exactly. I like it. So maybe that would be it. But they'd have to get through. They're like, oh, here comes ice. Get on top of it before it solidifies, right? So anyway. So yeah, that's kind of fun. And there's it, there are people who there are scientists and engineers who devote their entire careers to studying these things. So like maybe an effect. Um, and when you start taking. Is anyone in here in fluids? You guys aren't in fluids right now. When you take fluids, uh, and if you do mechanical engineering or chemical engineering or petroleum engineering, you're going to spend a long time doing fluids. If you're civil or electrical, you'll just see it, and then you know, you'll get a little taste of it. But there are scientists and engineers who spend their you know, years and years and years studying odd effects of different fluids. So. So yeah, and you know, when I say odd, it's not just for the oddity, it's for the properties that they carry, like we're just talking about water. You know, um, refrigerants, for example, their ability to change phase from a liquid to a vapor and pull heat out of an insulated space is what they're designed to do uh, without killing people in the process. You know, I mean, that's why like uh, ammonia, you know, ammonia is great, but ammonia is deadly. So you don't want to have someone running it in their refrigerator, in their kitchen, or in their car, heaven forbid. So, but some commercial applications do use ammonia, but you just have to be aware of your audience for that sort of thing. So, anyway, all right. Other questions? Where should we go from here? Does the so we talked about the saturated liquid slash vapor? Yes. Also known as the two phase. So yes. Like. Is there something that like separates the two? Like would we call it saturated vapor if it's more towards the ah, side? Super. Or would we call it, yep. or does it matter? It does, and it's a great question. Inside here, when you're more than 0% steam quality and less than 100% steam quality, mm -hmm. you call it the saturated liquid vapor region. So you use okay. both terms. On this line, at the exact point where um, X is 100% or one, that's the saturated vapor line. Okay. And on this line, it's the saturated liquid line. So saturated liquid line and saturated vapor line are boundaries of the two-phase region or the saturated liquid vapor region, and they meet at the critical point. Okay. So those, those two points on either side, like the one on the left, yes. would be um, saturated liquid. Yes. Saturated. Yes, perfect. Perfect. So for the bottom part of Yes. Yeah, but so we're over here, right? X equals 1.0, or we could say 
and we are given a temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so when we go into the chart, into the tables, um, we're still with the two-phase region or the saturated refrigerant, right? We are not looking at the pressure table. We want the temperature table. We're told that the temperature is 110 degrees. So that means that if it asked us for V sub G, it would, the V would be V sub G, which is 0.29 and some change. Um, U sub G would be 109 and some change. H sub G would be 117. And S sub G would be 2.218. And we know that it's G, the S sub G, because we're right on this line. Okay, and even if you want to go back to this equation, you could say 1 times H would be equal to 1 times H sub G plus 1 minus 1, which is 0, times H sub F. So mathematically, it also makes sense in that proportionality. Oops, so I put that on that. Space, yeah. There would be no ISO bar. In space? Is it 0 ATM? It would be... Um, that you know that's a really interesting question you would still have depending on the nature of the fluid some potential behavior that would look like this but depending on the fluid it would I mean but the behavior would be the same just um, at a very very low pressure so yeah and I'm not really sure I'm sure that's tabulated somewhere I mean just because scientists like to do that kind of thing but I don't really I don't really, I don't know that I've ever seen that. The lowest pressures that we really get to here are like um, 5 PSI, which is about a third of an atmosphere. So, but one would expect the behavior to continue as the pressure decreased. Yeah, good question. So on this table, mm -hmm. it has um, internal energy, internal energy is U, enthalpy is H, and entropy is S? Yes. That's correct. And the, your author and sort of the, the, um, the discipline of fluids and the discipline of thermal and the discipline of chemistry are pretty rigorous about using those letters. So the other thing to note is that if you use lowercase u, s, or h, it's generally on a per pound or per kilogram basis. So in other words, it's a an intensive property, okay? If their capital, the same letters, V capital, U capital, and uh, H capital and S capital, that means that it's total. So they've multiplied the pounds or the kilograms through. So you just get a value in BTUs or kilojoules or something like that. Um, then, it, then we get to the letter V, which is like the most overused letter in thermodynamics. So we have to be a little careful with that. So, yeah. So you have to look for context. Yes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> the view, the thing. And sometimes if they have a small letter, uh, like U, small letter with a bar over it, that means per mole. So they have, but it's always based on some quantity. So either if it's just you without a bar, it's usually either pounds or kilograms. Um, but if it's a bar over it, it generally means it's per mole. Do you get what that little symbol means, per mole? Yes, when it's like you with a bar over it. But once again, or look for context, yeah. You know, look at it and kind of think, you know, because it will tell you the units as well. A good engineering table should always provide you with units. So you shouldn't be guessing at that. I mean, you sh they shouldn't make you guess at that is what I'm saying. Another question about the PSI. Yes. So sometimes it says PSI A. Yes. I saw one that said PSI B. PSI B. Is that a typo? I think that's a typo. Um, PSI G. G. So what's the difference? PSI A means that they've included atmospheric pressure. Okay. PSI or PSI, and PSI is just ambiguous. PSI G means it's a gauge pressure. So that means that you are basically subtracting out atmospheric pressure, or it's what you would read on the gauge. You know, yeah. Like you take your tire, your tire pressure gauge, and it just says zero until you 
included on the tire, and then if it says 35, what it really means is if the atmospheric pressure is 14, you really have atmospheric, you would have, that's correct. Yep. I think that's what I mean. Super, super that was one of the questions. Is like a, yeah, that was 341. 341? 374. 374. Yep. Yeah. Oh, there it is. And it's even an automobile tire pressure. Yep. Very nice. And like I said, I think I've told you this, but here in Powell, Wyoming, we're at a pretty good altitude. So our atmospheric pressure is really more like 12 and a half PSI. If you get a bar barometric reading. But it is confusing to me when you get your, when you get data like from the Weather Channel or like if they report what atmospheric pressure is, um, they correct it to sea level. And I'm sure there's a good reason for it, but I don't really know what that is. So if you actually had a barometer, you have to adjust your, you have to adjust it to your altitude. So I know one good application for that is uh, like people who fly little planes like Cessnas and so forth, they actually, their altitude is determined barometrically. So they dial in when they're in the airport, they dial in the barometric pressure, and then that gives them the altitude of that airport. Because when you're flying, of course, being above everything is the important deal, right? <laughs> Whether, whatever, whatever up means is where you want to be. So if you were flying from Billings, which is at an, uh, an elevation of about 3,000 feet, to Laramie, which is at an elevation of 7,220, you know, that means that if you flew straight, you'd still, you'd be 4,000 feet below the top of the terrain at that point. So you definitely want to know where you are, right? And you want to know where the airport is. You don't want to dial your airport into zero, in other words. You want to dial your airport into what the elevation actually is so that you can, on your flight path, you can stay above everything. Have you ever wrecked drones like that? Probably it could be, you know? I mean, they that's... They have cameras on the bottom that actually, oh, like, depending on yes. how sophisticated it is, it will, they even have ones that have, like, sensors that make it so you can fly through it. Ah, oh, sweet. So take a video of you like riding a mountain bike without crashing into a tree. That is extraordinarily cool. So, yeah. Neat stuff. So there's lots of good applications. That's one of the things that I love about engineering is I think I, I was doing some um, lectures for K-12 teachers who are teaching engineering modules and I said, you know, I really think it's true enough to tell your students what do engineers do when we do everything. I mean, if you're interested in anything, there's some field of engineering that's going to tie into that. So if you just kind of like the world, if you like the universe, I think engineering is the right place for you. So anyway. So what else do you guys want to know about? All right, so uh, let's just take a couple of minutes then and discuss. I will not be here Thursday, and then I don't plan to be gone for quite a while. Um, this yes, thir uh, but if you need me, email me, and we can. Um, I can either email you, or we can talk on the phone, or we can do a Zoom conference. Um, the other thing is is that our midterm exam is uh, scheduled for the last day before midterm is. Friday, March 6th. And um, so my preferred time to give you your midterm exam would be during this class period on Tuesday. But there are going to be many of your classmates who are taking them outside of this window. So you have, I shouldn't even say preferred, I would say the easiest time to do it would be Tuesday at this time period. However, there will be a lot of times during that week um, that we can schedule an exam. So let's just put it this way. If you choose not to take the exam Tuesday, March 3rd at 10.50 a.m., just let me know. That's all. It's no obligation, but just that's when I'll expect you unless I hear otherwise. Okay? All right. Did I see a question before I started doing that? Um, Isaac? Yeah, so... Safe bet to call everybody that, Isaac. Here? Oh, okay. Right. H yeah. is the value of uh, the H value of our mixture okay. in the so two phase envelope. Uh, in the 
You got it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, H is what we what we're told our h value is yeah. right and everything else is in the table that's right so then that's kind of the reason i went back to this equation was to show you can solve for anything with this like if you knew the steam quality and the pressure or temperature you could find h of your mixture right so or you can find x or you can even use it to find h sub g or h sub f in the odd event that those things were not available to you but you only can find one thing but you can find any of those things using your algebra scale. So, good question. What else? You guys are great. So, um, like I said, I'm always available whether I'm here or not, which I try to. I will try to be. I'm, I just have this week, and then two weeks from now, I have a, a research summit in Laramie to go to. Um, that actually get to present some stuff about polymers, which is kind of cool. But anyway, um, and then I don't really have any other days except for those. It'll be a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, two weeks from now, that I'll be off campus. But I'm always available via phone, email, Zoom. Okay? So uh, if you need to get a hold of me, do not hesitate. I'm not on vacation. I'm still working. So, all right. All right then, gentlemen, that's it for today. I hope you, uh, I wish you the best of luck. I think you're all doing great. I love your questions. It shows you're really tuned in and getting what's going on. So, uh, like I said, just um, make sure you get a hold of me if you have further questions.